Manhattan, and then they moved up around the bay. So then I used to spend some, I actually spent more time with them when they didn't live next door. So I'm an only child from a large family, you know, it's, okay. yeah. So like, how, how does that dynamic work? Because that's actually an interesting, uh, I guess, concept there. Like, do they, what do you mean by just give you away that they just go like, here's our baby, you take care of it? I guess, you know, I was only eight months old, so, yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't really remember. No, and then fair. I never really felt like I could actually ask. But what the story is, is that I went in the hospital when I was eight months old with pneumonia. And when I came out of the hospital, mom and dad's house at number seven was damp and cold. And at May and yeah. Fien and Uncle Jack's house was warmer and not and drier. And so I went there, you know, at, from the hospital. And then I guess, you know, they forgot to come up and get me or they never gave me back or you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and it was much more common as it is in most subsistence kind of uh, cultures uh, for um, other people to bring you up than your, you know, like Michael Crony was talking the other day and his aunt wanted to take him because they had no kids and they wanted to take him. And there was a period of time where they were thinking about giving him away, but they didn't give him away because he was Michael Crummy and so adorable, but me, they did. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like it, 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 it is more, it was more common for sure. Now I want to ask you, of course, when did you get into the whole, like uh, the comedy aspect? Cause for myself, like I knew, when I was coming out of high school down here and I believe Rick said it at one point in one of his Rick rants it's like are you going to Mon or if you're not going to Mon you're going to Kona so that's the only two options so I went to Mon but in my mind I was like I want to be on SNL like I want to do comedy stuff um, but I like never really seen anyone go out of the province to do it until I seen like this hour's 22 minutes Codco. you didn't see Codco? I, we I'm were 20, on in 19 19- listen Mary, I'm 29. <laughs> yeah, so, but but you didn't, because it sort of was a continuous stream after that, right? Like there was Codco, then there was the wonderful Grand Bands, then there was uh, up at, you know, um, uh, what's it called? <laughs> this Tower and Rick, you know, so it was like on ending of people going and doing comedy. Oh, no, like, I, I've seen it, but it was just to the point where I was looking at it and I'm like, okay, like, these people had connections or they went from, like, once you went to Cod Code or this hour's 22 minutes, I'm like, okay, you're kind of made, where I'm just, so like, I wasn't down here like a Mark Critch doing shows or at local comedy festivals, so I was like, okay, how do I get there? And I'm only young, so at the time I was like, well, I guess I can do a communications degree and see where that leads, Right, so, right, yeah. right. Well, what seems to work, and of course, Johnny Harris and all them were in, um, uh, you know, and, and Rick was in, um, Rick was in Corey and Wade's Playhouse. Yeah. Uh, Johnny Harris and, and Steve and Dave Sullivan and them were in the Newfoundland um, a dance party. And so it's, and we were in Codco, you know, which was a comedy troupe. And Critch was in... Um, cat food so it yeah. seems what seems to work in from out of newfoundland is to get in a crowd and do <laughs> you know that's what seems to work now people are mostly i suppose these days doing more stand-up yeah uh, but i think that really you know how does stand-up uh, help you to do a sketch comedy show or even a sitcom, you know, I mean, I know stand-ups go into sitcom, they use the material yeah. and stuff like that. But I just think that, um, you know, sketch, you know, sketch comedy troops, like you, you really, you really have to act as well as do comedy, right? Like, it's just a good, a good start. Yeah. I want to ask you too, um, like, tell me about how this all Codco came to be, because now you said 1988 to 1993. Now, we had Kathy on, uh, like, this was maybe a year ago, and Kathy was saying more or less, like, you got your start kind of on the wonderful grand band, and then that kind of went into Codco. No, 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 no. Codco began as Codco in Toronto yeah. with Cod on a Stick in 1973 okay. or 1974, right? Yeah, I don't think Kathy would have said we got our start. No, no, I think no, I, I, I think I think. I mean, Codco was... did tours of England. They did. We did American in 1976. We represented Canada in Philadelphia. 
uh, you know, we broke up, I guess, in 76 and we went our own way, kind of. And yeah. uh, then Michael Donovan approached us in 1986, I think, uh, to do uh, a CODCO TV show, which none of us really wanted to do because really we'd been broken up for 10 years, but we'd worked together on and off with each other and stuff. But it seemed like a good idea. And so we went up to Halifax to do... Um, you know, the Codco TV show. So tell me like how this all, because I, I guess you kind of explained it a little bit, but I'm just more or less interested in, this, in the side of like, how did you go then from Codco to 22 Minutes? Because I know Tommy wasn't involved with 22 Minutes. That's where we got Rick. No, it, it didn't have anything to do with Tommy. I went to Michael Donovan and I, I yeah. wanted to do a show at the LSPU Hall every Friday night that um, did the news of the week, right? Because yeah. we had done a lot of newsy kind of stuff in Codco. Um, and so Michael said, well, you know, Evan Fitzan is looking for a show just like that. Evan Fitzan was running CBC at that time. And so somehow between the jigs and the reels, we ended up with, they ended up with um, Canadian Air Force okay. and... Um, and uh, this hour is 22 minutes. And I went over to Rick and Gerald's and I said, you know, I'm just, and Michael said, I think it's a good idea. I went over to Rick and Gerald's. I went down to Kathy's. I said, you know, Kathy, you know, it's going to be a news show. It's going to be making fun of the news. Like, uh, that was the week that was. And she said, I don't do news. I don't, yeah, yeah. you know, and I said, well, that would be great. I think that that's a whole different point of view. That's what we need. Yeah. Uh, Rick and Gerald, Rick had just done a show, uh, Charles, Somebody Must Die. And so Gerald said, well, I will we'll do it if I can be the creative director. And then we got Toomey, Greg Toomey, and Andy was supposed to do it too. But then Andy didn't decide that he didn't want to do it. Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned that like almost verbatim as what Kathy said in her interview too, because Kathy was saying – like when you came to her, she's like, I don't do news. And you're just yeah. like, no, that's great. We want a different kind of opinion. And yeah. she gives you credit for like, you know, giving her this career or how long this career that she had with 22 minutes, because she's like, you know, sometimes Mary can be right in your face, but she's like, she's always pushing me. And she's like, I like that because I need someone to push me. And I was like, well, that's great. And I was like, so are your friends? She's like, well, we're more like sisters. And I was like, that's, that's a very comfortable way of putting it. I want to ask you, because between going from Codco to this hour's 22 minutes, I believe like the Toronto Star had this reported there too, but like they were talking about um, you battling alcoholism. And you mentioned a quote of more or less saying like you, you were so glad that you got through it because you don't think you would have done this hour's 22 minutes if this was still like in your system or you were still battling this. Like, tell me like how tough a battle that was to go from like to, to face this kind of addiction. It's funny now because it's so long ago, you know? Yeah. And, you know, it's like when people have babies, they go on to have the next baby, even though they swear when they're having the baby that they'll never go through pain like that again, but yeah. they just forget. So it's one of the really good things about being a human being, I guess, is that we tend to forget the more painful. But there wasn't really a break. We stopped in 92, and yeah. this hour started in 93. So I had stopped drinking in October, I guess. And then I went to uh, Theatre London in London, Ontario, and did a play with Martha Henry and Calm Fjord. And so that was tough. That was really tough because I just didn't know how to have an opening night. But luckily, Roly Eugel was there and he'd been sober for 20 years. And Calm had been sober. I suppose I shouldn't say that. I don't know. Uh, for a couple of years too and so you know how sometimes you just fall into something and so everybody was in the same boat kind of so it was really I was so grateful for that and I realized you know as a, that everything I realized that everything in my life had been an excuse to drink really like opening night really the only reason I get ready for opening night was so I could get loaded on opening night but um so bit by bit so then we started I guess that was, I was there till January. I can't remember really when we started this hour, but uh, by the time I got to this hour, you know, I wasn't struggling 
with the actual wanting to have a drink. I was still struggling with the isms of alcoholism, yeah. uh, but I wasn't really struggling with wanting to have a drink. So, and of course, I never would have been able to do a weekly show if I'd been drinking. You know, it just wouldn't, just would never have happened. You know. Yeah, like so, like I, I guess in another way of wording it, or, or an kind of side topic here, but like, when did you finally? Because some people find a breaking point where it's like something just happens in their life and they're like man this has to stop like this this is like tearing me apart here but like did you ever have a moment where you just kind of sat there and just said okay like this is this is messing things up for me like i gotta stop or like when did this kind of breaking point come through that okay i've got to battle this or i've got to find a way to to defeat this i didn't have you know a big heroic it was i did it because i had a son yeah and i just realized at some point that i was going to have to get sober and it really what well, didn't make me happy the thought of it didn't make me happy it made me very unhappy you know but i realized that i was just going to have to do it and there was no i mean it was like i guess you know people talk about spiritual awakenings yeah and i guess that was you know it doesn't sound very spiritual or something but one day on the stairs with a terrific hangover having drunk a bottle of whiskey at ron hines's the night before not gotten home till 11 o'clock in the day and my partner at the time was very, very angry with me. And yeah. I was sitting on the stairs and I just, it just came to me that I had to do, I had to, I had to get sober. And then that made me really unhappy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, it, like obviously like anything, like, you know, if someone's trying to quit smoking, quit drinking or whatever, like it, it's obviously a tough process. Mm. Like, did you ever have moments of, I like, again, feel free to answer yes or no to this, but like, ever had moments where like you had so many months that you were sober and the next minute you just like relapsed or you just thought like, okay, like I didn't, it's I just didn't, going, thank God, okay. you know, yeah. at that point I, I've been knock on wood, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I've, I've been sober now, uh, October the 31st, I'll be sober 29 years. Oh, wow. So, you know, I'm really very grateful for that because, um, it's like having a life. <laughs> yeah do, like do, do people obviously like that probably don't know about this side like if you're going to a party or something do they offer you a drink like how hard do you find like is it harder now or is it easier now to just say like no like i, I don't want one or I'm, I'm okay you know the funny thing is when you're drinking all the time you think everybody's drinking all the time and you think yeah. the whole world is half loaded you know because you are yeah. But when you're not drinking, I mean, I don't, nobody offers me a drink. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> even when I first quit, like people would, you know, be saying, oh my God, it's so bad at Christmas parties. And people are saying, you know, go ahead, go on by, have a drink. Yeah. But I don't think I ever experienced that. I think people were relieved that I wasn't drinking. There'd be more for them. And, yeah. uh, and you know, like uh, I, I never came under any pressure to have a drink. You know, yeah. I got supported uh, by everyone, I think. Everyone was sick and tired of me uh it, you know being in the state i was in i think everybody was relieved that uh you know it might be on its way out <laughs> yeah. i want to ask you too because now you know being on this hour's 22 minutes um uh, how long have you been on like how long were you on 22 minutes do you remember 12 years i stayed 12 years all right like in that 12 years like do you remember anything like um because obviously there's iconic moments that you remember or like uh i guess laughter or whatever like certain moments that way but like was there anything that you're really proud of on 22 minutes that you come back to him like i can't believe i did that or like this is something that kind of cements your legacy it's really like not like me to be like yeah. that yeah you know i'm I gonna make you like that, that Mary. i'm making you like of... that with this question <laughs> i know but it just doesn't i mean it doesn't apply to me because i never think that way yeah i think you know um I, things I enjoyed on 22 minutes, you know, um, you know, it was always a really hard. It was really hard. We did a live show every week. We started on Monday with nothing and yeah. Friday night we did a hard, a, a live show. So, you know, it was hard. And, um, you know, some weeks I just would be crying on Saturday cause I didn't think I got the laughs and, yeah. you know, so the great thing about it was, in Codco, you could be crying, and then you just keep on crying because it'd be a whole other year till you were on again. Yeah, yeah. But uh, the uh, with twenty-two minutes by Monday, you had to stop the you know 
crying because you had to get at it to do another live show. Yeah. So it was great like that. Like if you uh, didn't let you rest in those darker areas, you just kind of had fest, to keep going. Yeah, right? it, like instead of festering over it, it's almost yeah, like, okay, yeah, I'm, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's funny because Mark said the same thing when we interviewed him. Mark was saying like, sometimes you're there and you're in a you're going over rehearsal and the joke is killing it like everyone's laughing and then when you go to do it live nobody laughs and it's like oh my god where do we go from here it's like just keep going just let like yeah. let it like 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 just let it fly off you because maybe something that you didn't think is going to be funny they're going to like laugh at and you're going to be like okay i got him back but yeah yeah it's always i feel like a lot of comedians would say that like when you don't get the laugh it's almost like it's a little bit draining. Like I think Colin Mockery said he kind of got into comedy because when he told a joke or did his first kind of stand up or set or when his friend dared him to, he's like, it, it became like an addiction to him where like people started laughing. You're like, okay, this is a way to make friends and get people around. I'm like wrong sense of wrong way to do it, Colin. But I'm like, I, I feel you. When people laugh at me, when I make a joke, I'm like, okay, let's keep this going. Because the moment that you start going serious, they're like, Oh, I don't like Brian. Brian went a little bit serious. I'm like, Oh man, got to come up with some more jokes. <laughs> yeah, I, I um, I don't know, Brian. I mean, I I know that um, you know, it used to be very hard not to get the laugh, and we would be very depressed. Like Mike Jones shot a film of us after we did a show in Carlton, I think, at your at your okay. school, and we were totally unprepared and really, wow. and everything was flat just flat and we were just backstage and we we're really really depressed i, wa I want to ask you too um because i know we talked about 22 minutes and codco a bit but like i was actually very interested um because i was watching hudson and rex because it's you know filmed here in newfoundland they were filming not that long ago here in whitless bay but i remember i was watching it one time just because i was like oh it's filmed here in newfoundland and you were on the episode and I was like really enticed in like the character they made you play. So I was like, man, this is Mary Walsh. How are they going to use her? And then it's almost like a little bit of a, a devilish side of it, a little bit of the, the cop side. And I was just like, I was like, oh, like she played this very well. But like, can you explain how you ended up getting this part? And like, did they come to you um, and ask you like, hey, do you want to be in this? And uh, like, I guess, how did it all come to be really? Well, I'm an actor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I have an agent. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have guessed that, Mary. Wouldn't have guessed and that. And I have an agent. <laughs> and yeah. so then, you know, I just did Transplant in Montreal. Yeah. So they reach out to my agent and they say, you know, we have a part for a woman who is a, of a certain age. Is Mary available? Yeah. Then they say yes or no. <laughs> then they ask me if I want to do it, you know, yeah. and then I do it. And That's how, the way like, it works. <laughs> and like, how how fun was that playing that kind of part? Like, you know, well, it was you're... a really stupid one because <laughs> I murdered two people totally unnecessarily. <laughs> I mean, you know, I could have just cooked the books. There was no need for two murders. Plus, then I confessed without even any pressure at all. I just sat down in front of Hudson, yeah, and just told him the entire story, like, yeah. It you was know, yeah. It's almost it wasn't like, the best it, Hudson and Rex episode. There are some fabulous Hudson and Rex episodes, and some of Hudson and Rex really, I guess, it's the dog. Everybody loves the dog, and yeah. then the landscape. I mean, they do a fabulous job of like things look, but that particular one, and everybody felt it too, yeah. uh, was just a lot of you know unnecessary murders, and uh, she could have solved them in another way. Yeah. And um, <laughs> and uh, then a complete, uh, you know, it, it, like they always say, show, don't tell. Whereas yeah. I sat down and told and told. Yeah, and it's told almost like as soon told. as they sat you down, you were like, all right, I'm, re I'm ready to blab. Let's go. Yeah. Let's do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like how, like, you're, you're right, because the way that they use sometimes the characters, uh, sometimes it's hit or miss. Like, I think when we had Justin Kelly on, on um, I, I believe he plays uh hudson's like kind of right hand man like more of the tech savvy i'm blanking on the name now uh but like uh i remember having him on and i was talking to him about alan hocko's episode and i was like how do you have alan hocko in this episode and not bring in like republic of doyle how do you not make this a crossover and he was like he's like yeah we, we just missed the mark i'm like no you didn't try you just brought him in as this bad guy it's like people would probably like the crossover <laughs> right 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 yeah, because I, I mean, he he did like kind of 
hint at that like oh it could be in the future we could do it i'm like well yeah but like i think that's what people want to see is like you know have this big like big but you know um yeah. hudson and rex has a massive international audience right yeah i mean they sell in 15 countries at uh, 15 or 20 countries and you know i mean i guess like a lot of it is the star yeah. and the dog and the landscape and the, and just the ease of the murder mystery and so if, if maybe if um if uh, republic of doyle was still on they would do a crossover but That's republic fair. of doyle hasn't been on for years so yeah you know what i mean i want to ask uh, a little bit of the fun aspect of the podcast uh where it's kind of like a shoot fire question here so for like a rapid fire question here they're just pretty simple they're just off the cuff um like if you had a project that you were looking back on that like either you auditioned for or you, you've seen it later on and you thought like, oh, I would have liked that role. Is there something that comes to mind that you thought like, oh, that would be a cool role to have? Oh. Well, you know, a lot of things, really. I mean, have we got all day? You know, I, uh, <laughs> I, mean, I, got all I really <laughs> like uh, acting and um you know, I like the process, but mostly I have to spend time writing my own parts and then producing them and, and um, you know, and so I really enjoy all the roles I get. And so I always think, oh, I could do that. Oh, why they have, you know, I'm like, I didn't realize that in Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream, when yeah. the mechanicals are saying, the guy of the mechanical is saying, I could be the moon. Why can't I be the moon? I know I'm the wall, but I could play the moon too. Yeah. And that Shakespeare was making fun of actors because we're all like that. Like, why, why, why don't I have that role? I could do that role. They don't know I could do that role, you know. Yeah. So there's so many. It's just, uh, you know, not even worth mentioning. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, like as someone who does podcasting, but also likes getting into the acting side, it's like when you send out something like when they ask you to send out a tape or something and you send it out and then you're like, I'm going to do that role, that role and that role. And they're like, OK, easy. I'm like, listen, I'm just putting all my all my eggs in a basket, hoping that I get something. And then they're less like, yeah, OK, we'll keep you in mind. I'm like, oh, please do. <laughs> um, I want to ask too, like um, kind of like going over now COVID, I feel like we're getting near the end of COVID here in Newfoundland. I don't know about the rest of the world. I don't keep track of the rest of the world, but I like what was something that you either accomplished or you set aside during COVID and you thought, oh, well, now that we're kind of in a lockdown, I got to do this or I got to accomplish this. Well, I had directed my and written and, and was in my first feature film in about 2007. It was called Young Triffy based on Ray Guy's play, Young Triffy's Been Made Away With. And I did it with Cinemagineer. It was about a $4 million movie, which is a lot of money uh, for a Canadian. People are still making $600,000 movies. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and it was an absolute and total failure. It was my first time directing. And, um, you know, I, I, I just stopped. I just stopped. It was just so horrible. I never did it. So what COVID helped me to do is I'd always wanted to make a film of Agnes Walsh's poem, Dad in the Fridge Box. And so I got the script done, I raised the money, um, I made the film, we edited the film, the film's going out to, it's just a short film. So it got me back on the bike again. And it was like years that I just, the, you know, the, the uh, I couldn't, I just couldn't get back uh, in the director's chair again uh, because I had had such a traumatic uh, go round with Triffy. But, um, mm -hmm. so that was great. And then, Dave Sullivan was writing uh, on Facebook these things about the missus downstairs. And then I, I contacted Dave because we had lots of time. And I said, you know, I was born to be the missus downstairs and you're born to be you. We should do this. So we raised the money for that and we shot that this summer. And, um, you know, and it's really, it's just six 10 minute pieces for five. And Kathy and I did more, you know, the thing on Jim, that's not from this hour is 22 minutes. That's a production. I produced that. Yeah, yeah. And um, Kathy and I did at the beginning of the pandemic, more Mrs. E's because at the beginning of the pandemic, we, the Mrs. E's who are in their 80s, um, were the, you know, the targeted group. So yeah. we did a lot of just me here in Newfoundland and her there. And we went on the thing. So there was, a, and I darned some socks too, <laughs> which I hadn't done in 30 
50 years. I thought, oh, this is going to be interesting. I'm going to get, end up darning socks. And I started my second book. Uh, my first book, um, you know, was a Canadian bestseller called uh, uh, Crying for the Moon. And now I'm on my second one. And so I started on that. And, you know, we're making another we made Christmas Fury, and now we have a script for Halloween Fury, which is, you know, frighteningly funny. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so a lot, I got a lot of work done because a lot of my time in the last 10 years or so before COVID have been spent on the road, just going from gig to gig to gig to gig. And so, the, you know, I hate to say this because it sounds so cool in a way yeah. but COVID I I, uh, I I had a very good plague it was yeah, good that, for that, me that's yeah. fair I feel like yeah. you know I, I, I'll put it my own word in here too because you know in terms of COVID when it first started like yes there's panic there was people worrying I'm kind of like a hermit anyway like any like I like to kind of keep to myself most times or I'll interact yeah. with people but like I use COVID as a, like a way of like, oh, I'm going to go watch Saved by the Bell. I'm going to watch like this era's, like, uh, you know, like some yeah. this era's 22. Like, actually, it's funny because I started taking out VHSs and turning them into like things that you can put on your computer. Right. And the biggest, the biggest slate we have in my house is like there's home videos that apparently I taped over for wrestling. And I was like, right. okay. And then there's <laughs> ones that I find that's just no label. And it's my brother had taped this hour is 22 minutes off the TV. So I'm just like, Oh, that's, that's great. Like, right. awesome. <laughs> We're going to put this on like a computer as well. Um, yeah. I, I want to ask too, to, to kind of close it out, but, um, and I, I feel like I wouldn't be doing anyone fair if I didn't, if I didn't say this, but like in Kathy's interview, Kathy, I think we had her on just before the East coast music awards happened. And uh, Kathy was like, man, like, um, it was like, Oh, what's uh, yeah? She said, Critch, Critch, and Mary like to do all this work. They like to be so like they like to be involved. They like to keep themselves 